Good evening and welcome to this Farm Advisory Service webinar titled Breeding and Feeding for Sustainable Sheep Systems. We are joined today by our guest speaker Dowie Jones of Innovus Breeding Sheep. My name is Daniel Stout, I'll be your chair tonight. Uh, I work for SEC Consulting and I'm joined today by two colleagues, uh, Craig Bothwell in tech support to make sure this whole thing runs smoothly and Hazel Lawton who will be handling your questions uh, for which there'll be plenty of time uh, for a bit of discussion with Dowie later on. A bit about tonight's webinar uh, entitled Breeding and Feeding for Sustainable Sheep Systems. This is the first output of a project we've got running with the Farm Advisory Service uh, called Sustainable Sheep Systems Project, uh, which will be running over the coming year and we'll discuss uh, sustainable low-cost sheep systems uh, with a multitude of forward-thinking farmers and industry experts through webinars, po podcasts and technical notes. Uh, I think this webinar uh, with Dowie really encapsulates the key themes uh, of the project, which includes how to develop low-cost sheep production systems that both achieve high levels of livestock performance, but from grass-based low-cost systems, that uh, the importance of grassland management, grazing strategies, and designing systems that suit grass availability uh, to reduce reliance on purchase feed, such as uh, appropriate lambing date to lamb on grass without supplementary feeding, uh, lower cost forage based wintering systems, be that forage crops or deferred grazing, uh, breeding the right genetics for the system. Uh, we couldn't have a better speaker tonight to speak about such topics. Uh, tonight we're joined by Dowie Jones. Dowie's a Welshman uh, from a family farm on the Clin Peninsula in North Wales. Dowie studied at the Welsh Agriculture College and then did a postgraduate in New Zealand uh, where he studied uh, genetic selection in New Zealand Romneys. He then came back to Wales and spent 10 years uh, leading extensive sheep research projects at the Institute of Rural Sciences uh, in Aberystwyth in Wales, where he was involved in some significant pieces of work, including the Welsh Sheep Strategy, uh, the Long Wool Project, uh, which looked at indices in uh, long wool breeds such as Blue Face Leicester, um, early EID work when that was all just really kicking off, uh, the National Scrapie Plan as well. Um, and all that kind of led Dowie uh, in 2004 to set up a company called CBS Technologies, which in 2004 merged with two other companies uh, to become what is now known as Innovis. Um, in the early days, they were very much looking at artificial breeding, AI embryos and, and gene genotype testing, such as Scrapey. Um, and they still continue that in a different, in a different format. Um, but in 2007, Innovis started with, with Dowie at the helm to produce their own RAMs. Um, seeing a kind of a niche in the market to specialise in performance recorded functional genetics, where the stud flock are run on a commercial forage based system and outdoor land um, to really get that selection pressure. Um, and that has led them now, as, they, as, they, as they've grown, uh, to work with some of the most forward thinking farmers in the UK, um, where they are involved with them in a, in a breeding partner sense uh, to produce shielding rams for sale. Um, tonight's webinar will run for one hour, uh, possibly a little bit more. Uh, finishing about 8.30, maybe 8.45. Um, there'll be a presentation by Dowie Jones and then plenty of time for questions to have a bit of discussion. Dowie, over to you. Good evening, all. Hope you're all sitting comfortably at home. I must say I'm much happier doing this than driving a M6 because it's pretty horrendous <laughs> weather in the rest of it tonight. So quite nice to do it from. There we go, and we're away. So this evening, Daniel's given me a list of topics to cover and wanting to um, uh, keep to the script, I'm going to try and do that. But um, I'll try and keep you engaged if I can, because I appreciate it's a long time. You're probably all having dinner, so um, at least you can do that and um, come in and out as you so choose then. But um, the title, as you can see, Breeding um, and Feeding for Sheep. So Daniel's brief that he's given me is, is a long one, as you can see. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's actually um, looking at all these components um, within all of that. So we're going to go through those questions um, one by one. Um, why sheep need to perform on grass-based systems and it's something we think quite passionately about. When to lamb, low-cost wintering systems. And we have to appreciate there's lots to be on this seminar tonight that are doing all of this already. So um, I'm preaching to the converted and I'm sure that lots of you can actually give 
um, participants good input tonight as well. So please feel free when we do get into the question time, if people want to make uh, additional comments, there's a wealth of knowledge, I'm sure, around the screens tonight. So this is much more of a discussion than it is a lecture to any of it, really. Um, I'm going to talk about the importance of infrastructure and then how to breed for these um, wonderful creatures. So that, that's really the gist of it. Before we start anything, really, um, I have a question for you. And that question is, what's your hourly rate? So in other words, um, how much do you charge for an hour of your time? Because I'm sure Daniel will tell you what SAC charge. So I'm just interested for you to sort of think through what is your time worth? Because you're going to spend an hour on this tonight. Are you going to get value out of it? Certainly, if you'd driven um, quite a way to it, you would very much need to get value from it. So I would urge with all of these things, doesn't matter if it's this one or any of them, you need to find sort of three things really that you take home from them. And as I say, that might be from the chat, but um, value your time um, because it's a really useful exercise. And if you don't do it, the retailers and processors that you deal with won't give it to you. So very important to value your time and to actually try and get something out of these sorts of events um, within all of that. So as Daniel said, I spent 10 years in academia in research, and there are a few things I learned from that, and I thought I'd just share them with you, um, just in case there's people involved in it here. I've found over the years, both here and in New Zealand, that the most effective research really is driven when there's industry need, not with people in labs or in lecture rooms thinking of things to do, but when there's a true need from industry. And I think that's something we need to work on a little bit more in the UK, of identifying those elements um, and securing that really. And unfortunately, there's quite a lot of good work out there, even though some of the technology we use now is 30 years old, but it hasn't been used because that outreach hasn't really um, got there for it. So I think again, you know, within all of these, there needs to be a, a good level of outreach working for these. And I don't think generally that's working. And one of the problems with that I've seen, and I've been involved in lots of projects and lots of research, is that when people put projects together, they work out these wonderful matrices of how many people they're going to um, make contact with. And unfortunately, it does become a little bit of a statistical exercise of you've had an address of somebody, or you've had a name of somebody, quite often their age as well, and job done. Whereas actually, what's really important is understanding the quality of that information and actually are they new people are they the early adopters or are they the true people that need some of this work so unfortunately i think some of the elements involved in how we measure success in some of these things is a little bit flawed but the projects that i've been involved with that have worked really really well are those projects that farmers have been with it from the get-go and that's a really important i think for levy bodies for you that sit on some of those boards, that, that farmer involvement from the start plays a huge um, element in getting that information out there. And if farmers or stakeholders, processors, have a bit of skin in the game, as I would put it, in other words, they pay for some of it, then I think it makes it more real. And the same goes with advice and consultancy. In Wales, we have Farming Connect that actually gives a huge amount of good information out to farmers. But I do wonder sometimes that it's actually too easy on a plate and there should actually be some money paid for some of it because really um, knowledge is value with some of this. And again, the crucial bit in terms of that outreach is communicating to you in proper farmer terms. And that's very true of all sectors. Um, we talk about breeding values for sheep and cattle we, instead of actually talking about you know, the outcomes. And, and I think those are vital elements in terms of putting people off or getting people to understand them. So quite often, you know, you as farmers are the best people to actually relay those messages. So we need a few more sort of brand ambassadors for some of these to get them out there. Now, as Daniel said, I've been in business now as in proper business, um, although farming obviously was a business from home, but in proper business uh, for nearly on 20 years. And again, there's a few things I've learned along the way with that. Um, one of the things I've realized is how naive I was at the beginning. Um, we gave shareholding to people 
um, that were quite disparate, not really involved in the business. And by today, I'm thinking, why did we do that? Because when you um, put blood and guts into something, um, you actually need people coming along with you. And likewise, in board meetings, you tend to go along and agree with things sometimes that you know can't be achieved. And again, you know, that ability to actually say no and to sort of look through these things and work through them. And the bugbear of all businesses, farming, especially in certain times of the year, is that dreaded cash flow and actually getting um, feeding ourselves for months of the year. And, and certainly that's part of it. In terms of the plan, it needs to be solid and it needs to be reviewed regularly. And I would urge you, if you're a family business or a or family farm, to sit down with the two or three generations that you've got in the business or the farm employee and actually understand on one page, what are you trying to achieve for the next five years? Because that little one page business plan aligns um, what you're going to do enables you to measure success and to see if you're getting towards it because there's plenty of negativity out there there are some wins that we need sometimes and we need to celebrate those within it but it's interesting when you have people around the table doing that it's quite interesting what comes out you might find that granddad's ambition and yours and your children's or the workers are very different and obviously those need discussing when everybody are fit and able to do it so that one page business plan, nothing for the bank, not some long winded thing. This is something personal to you and all plans change and they have to. So you have to review. And I think no different to a farm, certainly in business, um, the value of any business is the people you have. If you haven't got good people, you really haven't got a business within that. And what I've learned over the years is that HR is a crucially important factor. But when I talk about HR, I don't mean the contractual bits. That's just something administratively that people do. The real HR is actually knowing what staff are thinking, um, actually allowing them to grow, keeping them engaged in the business. And that is a really important thing. And that's something that the person at the top needs to be doing. It's too important for anybody else to do it. So why there are HR consultants out there doing work is beyond me because really what they are there to do is actually just the administrative part of it. The HR really should be the main people of the business because it's integral to the business going forward. And with all of this, um, culture is absolutely everything. What you believe in as people, as a family, as a group, and how you act. And if you can develop a culture that is open, that is energetic, that is hungry, that is lean, especially these days, then you've got something that you can really work on. And culture is something, once you've got it, you have to protect it. And we put that matrix in when we employ people, that the last thing we want to find out is, will they match the culture? And if you employ well, you appoint well, then things follow on from that. So it's quite an important component, really, of developing the culture within that. And the last one on this slide really is feedback. Um, we've just sent out questionnaires to customers now, about 2,000 questionnaires to actually get feedback. And although it's nice to get good feedback, we're actually just as keen to get negative stuff so that we can actually learn from it and change and improve. So feedback is learning. Uh, feedback isn't for us to get defensive. Um, it's there for us to actually improve and learn. And again, I think that's something I've certainly learned over the years um, in terms of what we do. And very important that we celebrate success as much as we do failure sometimes, because it's all too often to actually beat ourselves over the head as opposed to patting ourselves on the back. And both are very important. As Daniel said, um, our initial business was artificial breeding um, in sheep and um, we set up in Malvern, brought what was Bill McKelvey's Edinburgh Genetics at that time, um, or Ian McDougall, I should say, actually. And then we bought Brit Breed from John, John Hunton, James Milne, and then set up a, an AI business in Northern Ireland. So really expanded to cover the UK. Um, but we found um, that the selection that was going on with some of the pedigree breeders was, was very astute from a business point of view but we didn't feel it was actually going to meet the requirements of our industry long term. So we decided, as Daniel said, through that time, 
to start breeding our own sheep. And understandably, in doing that, we upset some of our ram breeding customers, because I think I'd be upset if my service provider was starting to compete with me for rams. So um, we separated the business back in 2015, brought uh, a New Zealand investor into that business, um, rebranded it completely, moved it as a completely separate business, and also brought some quite neat cattle technology into the business. So if any of you have got some really good female cows at home, um, AB Europe has got a very good IVF lab now in Edinburgh. And you can see on the bottom of the screen, I put there the website there. If you speak to them, Gavin Tate and Paddy, um, the two main vets there on the cattle side are getting some phenomenal results. So you can actually get over out of your cow without too much um, intervention. You can fertilize them in a lab with lots of different semen if you want, sex semen also if you want, and you can actually get those embryos back to you. So it's a really neat way of moving um, your female lines, which are all too important these days, instead of just the bull genetics. So in 2007, we set up our sheep breeding genetics business with a blank sheet of paper. So I went back to New Zealand, did my usual trawling of the players, looked at various scenarios and decided to come back and work with a lot of the breeds we had here, but to actually do it using a New Zealand mindset and approach and some new technology as well. And from 2007 till today, which is still a fairly relative short time in sheep breeding terms, um, we're getting some traction at last. It's nearly killed us in doing it because it's been pretty hard work um, because sheep tend not to do what you expect them to do. They tend to die occasionally. They tend not to come through as you expect them. Um, and you've got all the balancing act of structure type to go with the performance. And you'll see as I talk through this later, we don't breed just on figures. We breed something that meets the eye because we need to pull customers with us on this journey, not just produce something because we think it's good. So the second, well, the first question, sorry, that Daniel posed for me is why really do we need to breed sheep to perform on low input cost, low cost grass based systems? And some of you on the call already do this very, very well, but I'm just going to go through in my mind for you what I think our future holds. And some of this needs to be defined and some of the policymakers haven't even defined it properly yet. But certainly, I think, and I think we all realize that, depending where you are, this side of Hadrian's Wall or Fulls Dyke, there are small variances, but the general drive is that we need to be more focused on our farmland as a living environment. Yeah, and, and to put it in, in um, basic terms, you know, and I did this myself the other day, I went for a walk um, the last dry day we had, which was two weeks ago, um, I actually tried to see what we had in terms of around us, in terms of wildlife, which isn't great this time of year. And I dug some holes to see where we are. We always did that for earthworm and for compaction. But I was doing it to see what we had going on within it. Um, and very interesting and actually very sterile. And that's telling me that there is some element in some of this that makes sense, I think. Now, we also, I think, need to have less dependency on our monocultures. You know, although we all like the lawns that are straight without any flowers in them, um, and we also like Italian ryegrass fields that are all the same. Um, generally, we're going to need to move away from some of these or suddenly look to use them or utilize them in a different way. And agrochemicals, obviously, and so many feed bins that are having lots of drops of feed into them this time of year in terms of bought in feed onto the farm. Um, I think we just need to try and work through some of these in terms of how we move away from them. And our big reconciliation, I suppose, is that in our future, public money is going to come for public good. And I say this in the loosest form because I don't think anybody quite knows what that public good is. It's a perception. But it's a perception that's there and it's a perception that's going to stay and I think it's going to dictate our policy going forward. So whichever way we go with it, um, we have to embrace it and work with it really. I'm pretty sure that we're going to see more rotation and mob grazing because the good news is that that helps our efficiency. We know we can increase our stocking density on certain fields in terms of growing grass by about 40%. 
but it also gives ground the ability to rest and it seems to have an environmental benefit. And a term that I haven't been that familiar with, latent, lenient, sorry, grazing, is effectively the ability to actually graze at much higher heights um, and to actually leave higher residuals. So we're actually looking towards those regenerative um, practices. So again, lots of work coming through with that, even with the lenient grazing of different heights that you, for birds, for example, and some of the grubs that you can have a different height and a shorter height, and that's more beneficial. So you have different heights within a particular sort. So, so there's lots of, of elements of development, which I think we need to think through. And obviously we have to create these friendly wildlife reserves on our farmland. Um, from what I saw the other day, it does look that within a specific area, as long as 20% of the farmers or the farmland is doing 10% of their farms, that meets the criteria. So it's probably not going to instigate everybody, but it does need elements where we let certain fields go to head. So we have um, a seed bank for birds in the winter, and we have corridors. And I'm sure some of you that have been on the higher um, environmental schemes are well used to this, but I think it's going to be spread much further afield to us. And dare I say it, I even this year, we're actually going to be reseeding after our root crops with some very different sward mixes. We're actually going to be putting into them a much wider range of seeds than we have done in the past. Um, again, because this is part and parcel of this regeneration. And some of the research I've found very, very interesting is that this concept of the right tree in the right place, especially in the plants, that, that trees are not the answer in some of the plants because they actually have a detrimental impact depending where they are in terms of their balance, what's above the ground and what's below. So again, lots of stuff we need to learn in all of this um, in terms of how that works. But certainly there is a place for corners, there's a place for areas to be um, planted. But it does look as if it's not as simple as saying, let's plant trees in that particular area um, within that. And obviously, we're going to be measured in the future um, on various matrices. And obviously, some of you will have already fed information into processors um, and, and retailers in terms of your carbon audits. But it looks as if the carbon, soil carbon, and it's quite shallow, which was a surprise to me in terms of where it's been measured. Um, 15 centimeters, which isn't very deep at all. Biodiversity and you know things like farm bird index, farmland bird indexes are the things I think that we all have to be um, ready to embrace into the future. So quite different, isn't it? Although this is talking about um, working off grassland, this is a dimension of grassland management, I think, that is very, very important to us going forward. Now, obviously, we need to focus still on our utilization where we can and balance that with the conservation within all of that. And we're seeing already a big uh, move of sheep back into arable rotations. And some of you were in our college uh, many years ago, like I was, you have things like the Norfolk four course rotation, those golden hooves and April still, we're back there. And we're working with a lot of arable farmers now setting up um, sheep flocks to actually put those sheep, those animals back into a grass rotation within some of those, dealing with um, organic matter buildup, trying to get that back up, dealing with black grass um, and actually helping substantially. And there is a huge opportunity for partnership in all of that. All of us are used to having sheep from the hills go on to dairy farms for winter tack, but I think there is a huge opportunity in working with some of the arable farmers in the UK because they have the land, they don't necessarily want to keep sheep, but they like the impact and the benefit that they have on their business. So sheep operators within reach of arable farms, there is a lot of opportunity there for you. And we'll be in contact with lots of people over the next couple of weeks now, because we have a lot of farmers, arable farmers in, in the east of the counties looking to put sheep into their systems. And we also have lots of sheep customers, farmers that have the ability to come close and do that with them. So I think we've got a real opportunity in working within all of that and really getting to a Kiwi type of approach where you've either got a breeding unit or you've got a finishing unit. And you know, the breeding unit works on the principle that you offload your lambs at a decent-ish price 
shortly after weaning, and you then build your grass up to flush those ewes to get a better scanning percentage. You don't really waste all your energy trying to finish those sheep in a situation where it's going to be quite difficult to do so. So again, trying to disentangle what is a breeding farm, what is a finishing farm, and how we work through all of that, because I think there's a real systems approach in all of this that we can work towards. And obviously, in terms of sale value, we have to add whatever we can onto the price of our animals. And the beauty of all of this lockdown, if there is a beauty on it, because there isn't much, is that people are digitally capable now. So people are buying, you know, ordering boxed lamb, boxed beef. You can sell your farm, effectively your image, and what you're about through direct order. And obviously there's farm gate. And again, we would urge everybody that can to actually add value wherever you can um, in all of your animals. And it even comes as far as um, draft views. You know, if you can actually improve the health status of your flock, prove what you're doing towards longevity so that when somebody buys your draft views, they're going to get another year or two out to them and they're not going to bring in any nasty iceberg diseases, then that's value added. So I think just thinking through how we add elements to what we're doing instead of just sort of taking it because it's there in the marketplace. And communication, which is something generally as farmers we're very good at doing, but communicating to the general public what we do, because actually you're doing a bloody good job. Um, we just need to make sure that people understand that so that they actually buy British and stop all this nonsense of what they're doing in terms of some of this other stuff coming in. So certainly in terms of an animal point of view, um, sheep, which is what I'm talking about, need to have an ability to perform off regenerative pastures, which is long rank pastures that have been rested for three months of the year and then going back into them. And also obviously lambs going into roots and finishing crops because both work within those systems. So sheep that can do that without having to have too much intervention. So I think we're going to see a lot more sheep behind electric fences. So good news to all of the suppliers out there, the Gallagher's and the and, and the various um, manufacturers. And certainly less hard feed. Well, I would hope so. Um, it, it frets me when I go up midsummer of M6, right through the Cumbria, and I see sheep in grass this high and this troughs, and certainly they are just substituting um, what they're eating. We are seeing more outdoor lambing flocks already, and certainly if there's migration more into arable units that are also going to have lambing flocks, they won't be looking to house their sheep. So certainly outdoor lambing is on the increase, we think. Um, it'll be interesting to see when the breed survey goes, gets compiled with SAM and AHDB, um, how the the flock has changed in the UK because the last one was in 2012 and also how some of those practices are changing. But certainly with antibiotic reduction in terms of what we need to do, um, in terms of labour scarcity, um, having some outdoor systems is beneficial. Not that it's the be all and end all, obviously. And one thing is for certain is that there needs to be more selection pressure in our pedigree or ram breeding flocks yeah sheep can't be run in a little bubble um, they have to be tested they have to be pulled apart so that they can actually perform for you um, in these systems coming forward and everybody can do it it's not something that's limited to just the big breeders it all can be done with a bit of thought but it's something we really need to think about um, as sheep or ram breeders within our industry so Daniel's second question, which was a difficult one in many ways, because when to lamb, because everybody are so individual and different. So um, I haven't really given any real recommendations because you'll know what you're doing really. But common sense, which doesn't always come through, but common sense tells us that we need to match our lambing to the grass growth curve of our farm. Yeah, so that in other words, as lambs are dropping down, um, as those ewes are going into early lactation into their third week, which is the peak, that grass is pushing through at that stage and they're setting that lactation through the rest of, of the next three or four months. 
because that's when that grass grows for the rest of the year, really. But it doesn't always work. I know plenty of people that lamp before that date, before that magic sort of um, photosynthesis is hitting us. And obviously, we need to mitigate risk of bad weather, certainly um, up in Scotland and in some of the more exposed parts of the UK. So again, those would be the two common sense elements. But in reality, um, there are other factors at play. And again, I know I'm sort of talking to the converted here, but if our retailers are buying British and the last one to go into 100% British has been Waitrose, so there's a displacement of quite a few hundred thousand of New Zealand lamb as of this year coming out of the UK, as opposed to coming in from New Zealand, then those supply windows change and we need to think of ways of dealing with that. And if you go back a few slides, those systems approaches, partnering with some of those arable guys is a very good way of dealing with that because there are catch crops that can be put in where she can form even when we're not in maximum grass growth. So there is a bit of thinking to do with all of that. And obviously, um, lots of people have day jobs, working from home most of the time now, but you have day jobs. And if you've got three or 400 sheep, then that probably is a part-time job. Yeah, nobody should really be busy with, with three or 400 sheep. Um, if you are, then you're just making work for yourself in our mind. Um, so, but that determines sometimes when you can be home to lamb and when you've got family members available um, within all of that, really. So the main principles, I think, of lambing, irrespective of when it is, are fairly similar. Everything revolves around getting that use condition right. If you've got a ewe that's lambing down in the right condition, all your problems seem to fade away. She, she can lamb, she's got good muscle tone, the lambs are vigorous, um, there's plenty of colostrum, and everything just sets off. When we don't get that right, and it's not always easy to do that, especially if we're outwintering, then, then it, it tends to add more work into the system. But as bizarre as it sounds, all effort needs to go into getting that ewe in the right condition. And it needs to happen not in the last two, three weeks pre-lambing, it needs to happen mid-pregnancy because those last two, three weeks, that nutrition is going in the lamb and we've got head ropes out and we're going to the vet again. Now, we are always firm believers of preventative medicine is better than treatment. So, and I'm talking about abortions mainly here, some nice big diseases, borders disease, which can give you a real headache at lambing time, but source clean sheep if you can, if you can actually have that honest conversation. And this is where partnership comes in again. When you speak to the people supplying your replacements, and you actually work out what they've got or haven't got, and you know if you have to vaccinate or not. If you have got a disease problem, then you need to know what it is. Because sometimes you can go for, for years, um, not sure, especially things like Campylobacter that take quite a while to come through before you can actually be lucky enough to find it. So trying to identify that cause with a vet, a, a good strategic vet, um, to actually understand what you need to do, and then you can deal with it. But prevention always, and it amazes me how busy the VI centres are, February, March, April, with dead lambs and abortions. Shouldn't really be, because we've got very good vaccines for most of these abortions, but yet we're still in a situation where there is abortions about the place. So I think it's, it's an element of prevention where we can. And your vet, really, in our mind, should be your business consultant, not your midwife. Yeah, um, you shouldn't really be having to take sheep to the vet to lamb, because you should breed sheep that can lamb, you should feed them properly, and as a consequence, you might get the odd thing, but the vet's real value is with you planning the nutrition of the flock, planning the health of the flock. And you've got to be willing to pay them to do that, because the value they can give you is huge if you've got the right vet and you're having the right dialogue with them. So it's a really important component of using them in that capacity, as opposed to fire brigade stuff. Um, and I know lots of people that lamb over five months and they're knackered and grumpy and they don't function particularly well, they don't think clearly. Now, 
our lambing in our nucleus flock happens over three weeks. There may be a few stragglers that goes into four, uh, into the beginning of the fifth, but three weeks. And we've worked with lots of flocks that have decided to have an early lambing for cash flow and a later lambing. The later lambing flock lambs outdoors, is on a forage system. The early system is, is, is a more intense system, TMR inside or whatever they're using. But the crucial thing there is that we're disciplined about it. And once those tubs are out, you either put a teaser in with a rattle, so you actually know what's repeating, or you actually work a system that gives you that rest period. And that rest is vital for your mental state so that you can get rid of your lambing stuff in the nicest possible way back to college if you're using them, and also an ability to sort out the disease buildup in that shed. Better still, if you're going to lamb the later sheep outside because it gives you that ability to do it. But really, I cannot see people lambing for four or five months on the trot. It just isn't, isn't sustainable. And as I told you before, going up that M6, it's crucial that we supplement grass, not substitute it, because we're substituting effectively a cake that might be 11 ME with grass that's probably higher and even higher protein, probably 23, 24% protein. So we're literally saying to the sheep, here, have this concentrate, and actually it's, it's the stuff that you're leaving behind is better than it, but we're doing it anyway because we want to spend money on you. Because that concentrate, you're looking at about 25, 26 pence a kilo dry matter, and that grass is costing about five or six pence a kilo dry matter. So it's a no brainer really, in terms of getting that balance right. But we haven't got confidence sometimes in our ability to do it off grass. And that's where the problem lies. So it's just understanding some of these dynamics within all of this. Daniel's third question, low cost wintering systems, grazing, forage and pre lambing So again, lots of you have different systems and I'm not going to any depth in these because I think Daniel has some very able speakers that are going to do some of these sessions for you later on. So I'm going to try and just cover them briefly, these sort of main principles, which I think are fairly generic through it all. But some of you that are um, social media warriors, um, I've just put a handle up there of Blevin Davis, uh, um, one of the guys in Mid Wales here who's a customer of ours. He's on Twitter. And Blevin has changed his whole system in Mid Wales to outwinter all his sheep on grass, uh, working with James and his team in precision grazing and getting on really well. So in a situation where the whole farm since the end of November, when he finished up being split into one hectare blocks and he is grazing through them neatly um, right through until um, 10 days pre lambing And he wouldn't have done that before. Before he would have put silage out, made a lot of silage. This crop has been wedged up, deferred on the fields, no cost, no diesel. Yeah, there's an electric fence cost, but that's an infrastructure one. Um, and he's getting on really well. And obviously, with all the bit of snow we've had, rolling bales out on those paddocks, set stocking for a period while that's happening, and then back into the rotations afterwards. And it can be done. And actually, his swords will be the better for it. There will be more biodiversity because actually they've been grazed for a period of time, short and sweet, and moved on and rested for big long durations of time so that mass below the soil of root structure will be building back up again. So all of these things are really neat and I would urge you to follow Bledin because he's a good lad um, and there's lots of them and there's lots of you up north as well that have been doing this for a while. So again I think the best people to actually show how this can be done is you yourselves. You've been doing it long enough so we just need to learn from everybody that have been doing all of this. When we go on to our crops, we always work really on feed budgeting because, and even on the grass system, you need to know if you've got covers. In Bledin's case, he had about 2,800 closing covers on the farm, so he could budget according to that, taking his residual down to about 1,500. So he knew how much, how many kilos per hectare he had, what the sheep was going to eat, and that gives you your grazing days effectively. Now, feed budgets are crucial because it enables you to make early decisions. You can go and find feed if you want. You can sell feed to others if you want. 
It gives you that ability to plan properly. Yeah? But to do that, you need to measure how much crop you have. If it's deferred grazing, you need to work out what, what dry matter tonnage you've got on the farm. And if it's crops, you're going to have to cut them and actually do a little equation and work out how much dry matter feed you've got on the farm. And we can work very easily what the requirements of the stock is to match the two things together. But feed budgets are essential. Yeah, and measuring and working out how much you've got gives you the power to make those decisions as opposed to flapping around in the dark. And we really have to develop systems that really optimize utilization, especially when we're putting crops in the ground that are expensive. For example, fodder beet. So fodder beet is an expensive crop to grow. You can't really cut corners with it. It works when you've got a big yield, but it costs you to get to that yield. And there's no point half doing it because it will fall down the other end with you. But having that utilization is crucial. And we know we can get about 80, 85% utilization in good conditions when we break feed properly with these systems. So again, if we are going to put a direct drill in the ground, put seeds in or plow or whatever else we're going to do, we have to be absolutely sure we can use it. And quite often having one big block doesn't help. Quite often having two smaller blocks that you can graze from both ends gives you the ability to graze for management groups so that you've got the ability for more flexibility um, within all of that. And even when we're on deferred grazing on, on sort of more hill ground, and we'll show you a video shortly of that uh, in Southfield where we are, um, back fencing is crucial so that you can actually not go back and overgraze parts where you've been. That's the whole principle behind some of this if you're going to actually rest ground for a period of time. And supplement when you need to, but you supplement in an informed way. Yeah. So we will supplement with energy, quite often energy more than protein, but sometimes protein. And based on forage analysis, what they're going to be grazing, and you can get really good forage analysis these days, what they're going to give them as silage. And you can even blood sample them. And I'm sure Daniel and his team in SAC will give you metabolite profiles of your animals to tell you exactly where they are closer to lambing, if they're in the right status or not. And you can do something about it. So again, doing things in a, in a simpler, cleverer way. So you see here, I'm not saying for a minute that you should put a concentrate or blocks into them. You need to understand what they need in terms of your feed availability before you do anything like that. And the same goes with this wonderful cloak and dagger business on minerals where people fall out, whether it's boluses or drenches or blocks or whatever else, you, you use them if you need them. And again, we can do forage analysis with that element. So not just the soil, but forage analysis for detailed uh, mineral content. We can do bloods for some of the, for the minerals and we need to do liver biopsies or liver uh, samples from cull use if we're actually going to look at things like copper properly. So again, working with your vet in, in a sensible way enables you to work that out. So we would never put any feed in with anything unless it's needed. And you spend less money finding what's needed and tweaking it to get it right than you do just throwing things at animals quite often in there. Now, there are hidden costs of winter crops, which <laughs> I found over the years to my, to my um, pain. And some of these, which we don't think about sometimes, is when that utilization goes to pot, when we get copious amounts of wet weather and our utilization goes from 80% boom, down to 50%. And we have to factor that in sometimes because it's a real cost, because your costs are just increased consequently. And also, it's quite difficult to get enough dry matter into the sheep when it's like that. So quite often, you have to put more baleage out to actually get that dry matter into them. And the fallow land, either side of crops, winter crops, is a real, real cost. Because if you're putting a spring reseed in, you've got at least six weeks, sometimes eight weeks, depending on what you put in, before you can graze it. So you've actually got quite an element of time. And sometimes you've gone out to the crop sooner than that, and you've got a, a, a lag period and in the autumn. So when you look at grass growing conditions, I always work the cost of forage crops by working out, well, if that was in grass, even a permanent pasture, 
what would it be doing and what have we lost in that process in actually putting these crops in there and it's an equation you need to do because it's actually quite substantial or can be failed reseeds obviously after those crops um, and uh, i've come to the conclusion that i really would like not to reseed fully anyway and that we would like to improve in lots of other ways if we can because when they go wrong they're a costly affair so again it's a real cost some of this sometimes and the other one that we've certainly found both in the nucleus flock when it was in Aberystwyth, and I suspect we're going to be finding it in Southfield as well, is there is a substantial maintenance cost when you're grazing sheep in very exposed sites. You will see when weather turns badly, temperature drops, the sheep is using more energy effectively to keep warm, and intake quite often increases by a third. So you might be putting two bales into those breaks, all of a sudden it's become three bales. And those maintenance costs, we're not quite sure of the dynamic of it properly. We're working with, or have been working with Bangor University, trying to understand cold, stress, and, and what that means. But there is a real cost that if that sheep wasn't there, it wouldn't be using that energy quite the same. And the energy will actually influence the protein metabolism because it needs both to work. So it'll also have an impact on protein metabolism in those sheep. So again, those exposed sites, we just have to think through sometimes where we're putting these crops and how we're going to graze them in terms of avoiding effectively wasting energy on those sorts of things. And one of the things, certainly one of the catches we found, certainly in Aberystwyth here in West Wales, is that we have in certain years bought fodder beet in um, because our crops, our feed budget is short. So rather than actually trying to do anything else, we've been buying an Arctic loads of fodder beet in, feeding that into the break where we're feeding the root crops so that we can effectively extend the grazing days. But there is a huge range in dry matter of fodder beet. So you could be paying 40 quid a ton delivered for your fodder beet, but it could be 13% dry matter, or it could be 22% dry matter. And that's a huge difference in the amount of feed value you're buying because at 13% dry matter, you're buying water. And we've got plenty of that. So actually checking the variety of that fodder beet is really important. Quite often, the deeper rooted varieties that are suited for lifting will be the higher dry matter varieties. So they're not as good for grazing. They're gonna be slightly further in the ground, but you need to just double check what the, what the dry matter of that variety is before you sort of sign up to say, I'll have an article or two of that. So a really important component with knowing all of that is check the dry matter if you're going to buy any of these root crops in um, into the farm. So I think it's time for a video so that you can stop listening to me for a minute. So I'm going to pass over to Craig if we can. And um, we're just going to put a couple of videos up of um, uh, one of our breeding partners, James Drummond in Northumberland. And James puts a lot of roots in. Uh, James probably on the call, I would imagine, on this. Um, and you can see him with his uh, fodder beet grazing. He does it very well, gets really good utilization. And also we've got um, a video of our nucleus in, in the borders. Um, and again, where we're using deferred grazing and actually moving through our sort of hill block or sort of, it's not proper hill, it's an upland sort of block. And again, we're using block grazing there instead of just letting him run. So, so Craig, over to you if things are working.
I hope we're back. I think we are. Please let me know if we're not. But generally speaking, I wanted to just show you those, just as some of the sort of systems that, that people are using. James feeds his sheep very effectively in, in Anik. Um, I think this year, slightly more expensive than last year because his crop wasn't as quite as good on the fodder beat. Normally he's on about two and a half, three pence per kilo dry matter growing his fodder beet. I think this year he was on about four and a half. And based on a 50-50 silage mix, um, it's still working at about sort of 16, 15, 16 p a day to feed them. So that's the kind of cost in that. But as you can see, as it said in that video, there is quite an element of you have to breed sheep to do this for you. I'm just moving on here in terms of, I'm just dwelling on Southfield, our farm, uh, near Hoik, which we've only just moved into, a Buckle farm, um, where the nucleus flock has just moved in. Um, we use Farmax, and lots of you in the borders will be doing the same. I know Jim, Logan, and Co, and a lot of the guys have been using Farmax for many years, and it's a great tool for actually working out your feed um, availability and, and to tweak your farm. You still have to measure um, and put it into it, but it's, it's a very useful tool. Um, but actually getting that feed budget working, getting the grass covers, um, the, the yield and the analysis is crucial, as I mentioned before. And this is real stuff that we're doing up there. And I'm just going to diverge just very quickly for a couple of slides on health, because we just have to be wary of this when we're talking about production, because iceberg diseases tend to come in and creep underneath the surface for you. So up in Southfield, we tailor the, the minerals to the farm after doing lots of forage analysis. Um, we, we use drenches and we use mineral blocks currently within all of that. We do fecal egg counting and we do lots of strategic screening to see what's happening from a health point of view. So we cut open dead ewes, we do postmortems on them just to see what's going on. And we certainly do quite regular condition scoring because that's really what tells us what's happening with that ewe flock. So that's our condition scores and weights and the nucleus flock that are changing from our wonderful sort of tupping period, our sort of 20 golden days, and most of these gained during the tupping period. Um, and they've held since. There's a handful that have gone backward. So, But it's a really useful tool. And I know there's a lot of work going on and people keep telling you condition score your sheep regularly. And I know you think it's old school, but it's a really useful tool to just understand what's happening um, within your sheep flock. 
One of the other things I just want to mention very quickly to you is that, and I don't know, some of you may or may not have done this. One of the things we do when we're farming is we understand, we try and get to the bottom of what drench resistance we have on the farm. So this was a drench reduction test we did on Southfield. And when you see on here, uh, in terms of the four family groups, anything that is red is resistance. Anything that is purple there is growing towards resistance and the green looks to be working currently. So that's telling us that that farm actually has resistance to most of the products. And that's crucial information because now I know what we drench our sheep with and how. And all our sheep, when we moved them into Southfield from Wales, they all got Zolvix into the farm so that they were quarantine dosed in. Um, but there was obviously residual resistance in that farm from sheep that had been there before. So a really useful and important tool that you need to do with your vets or with FECPAC or whoever in terms of understanding the drench status of your farm because it can really take away your production without you realising it. You're effectively dosing with a product and the worms are just living through it quite happily and building more resistance. So really important to understand that. And again, although it will cost a few hundred quid, probably about 300 quid to know this, it's vitally important and you think that what that's saving us in terms of our product and time in terms of being able to target the right product onto those sheep. I'm just going to finish Daniel's fourth question on infrastructure. I'm going to talk just very quickly on Southfield here, and I'm going to rush through this a bit because I'm conscious of time and four questions. So infrastructure, this is the farm in the borders. We start with mineral status and um, nutrients because we know that unless we get phosphate and potash status is right, nothing else works. So we start there. So we're working with RISER. Um, so that's a, a map on their contour program. So the whole farm has been screened. The farm, have, the farm has been zoned up. So we also know what the soil types are. And we've started applying. So Sean Williams, the manager um, on, on Bow Hill, has already put 820 tonnes of lime on this farm for us. And about just short of 500 tonnes of, of digestate. Um, from the from the bio, um, plant in Bow Hill. So getting that new and that we've got a neutron plan which sort of goes out for four years before we can get the indices of that place up to where they need to be. So we need to target the fields that will respond first and then work from there really. Water supply is a crucial element to any system where there's subdivision and we will subdivide because otherwise we can't farm properly, neither for environment nor efficiency. So we put a water systems gone into the farm. Uh, you can see on the map there, um, effectively two 5,000 litre pumps here coming, being fed in from two springs, pumping up to a 20,000 litre tank at the top and that gravity feeding back. And crucially, troughs put into fields where they are injunctions that can allow for subdivision and more subdivision um, again if needs be. But water can be a real bugbear um, when we're trying to do kind of the stuff we're trying to and then we've already done permanent subdivision on some of the fields, those white lines um, that you see on that map up there. Um, and then um, a mains through the farm so that we can actually connect into further subdivision using electric. And this is a good example where the hill block, or I call it a hill, it's not a hill really, um, the rougher part of the farm, um, we subdivided that and we've been grazing in blocks through that and we'll be just about We'll, we'll get us into scanning um, next week um, where we've actually managed to graze through properly, supplementing with a bit of silage. Um, and we'll do that better in years to come because we'll have more control in terms of the quality up there going forward. Handling systems. There's so many farms that don't invest in this. And this is uh, just a redo of a system that was in Southfield. It's not elaborate. It's just post and rail with a, with a with a loading area, space for a wagon to turn around and a relatively small um, double race, the far end. But it doesn't take much to put these things together, but so many people don't. Um, and so many people invest in kit like auto drafters and stuff without actually having the basics of a yard. And we think that actually, you know, you, if you've got a good basic handling system, you can do everything through it. So we're all about getting the basics right, using what you've got, as opposed to 
spending on lots of expensive kit that is going to sit around not doing a huge amount. Not saying that an auto drafter isn't useful if you've got thousands of sheep, but certainly in a farm that's only running about 12, 1300, can't really justify that, even with the recording that we do. So moving quickly on to the last section, because I'm conscious of time. Daniel's last question was, how do we breed the right genetics for these systems? And not just us, there's other people out there doing it. Um, lots of you in the borders, lots of you done it for a while. So how do we breed sheep that are going to be fit for purpose to deliver on these kinds of systems? And it's not difficult um, once you've got a base. And this is our uh, breeding platform. As Daniel said, we've got our nucleus flock, but we also got some very, very good breeding partners um, ranging from the top of Scotland with people like John Scott, um, in, in Fern, um, Janet Hill, just come on board now with Premieras, down to Baclou, Kevin Stewart. Um, so we've got quite a lot of activity and then James in the borders and then we go south. So just over, just short of 11,000 breeding ewes lambing down now, but that gray box on the left there tells you the size of the genetic evaluations. And once you've got data that is that robust, you start making proper gains you can actually start really crunching and Janet and Kim, our geneticists, are starting to have fun at last because they've actually got some proper horsepower to deal with now in terms of moving some of these traits forward. As I said, it's not the be all and end all, you still need a sheep, but this enables us to move much quicker with data because all of our breeding partners are recording. So all of those use, those 11,000 use are being performance recorded fully. Uh, and they're being run in a very commercial system as if they were commercial use. And that's a really important component. Selection pressure has to be in the relevant environment to where we need that progeny to work. And that's the big change I think we need as an industry that has to happen because that enables you to get sheep that will deliver the right traits um, in these systems. One of the dead easy ones we keep saying to people is your U size. You know, you really don't need 80 kilo U's if you're gonna produce a 20, 21 kilo lamb because you're gonna eat a ruck of feet compared to something that's smaller. Now, slim breeders have been saying this for years, as some of, some of the hill breeders. But generally speaking, you know, you can reduce that silage stack or your feed requirement for the winter substantially. And quite often it's low hanging fruit, just get that U smaller. Um, and as you can see over a, thousand new flock, that's not a small amount of money in terms of what you're going to need in terms of feed in general. And that's putting it at a fairly low level of 10 pence per kilo dry matter. And the my green tick there is an environmental tick. Less hungry sheep, less feed resource, good for the environment. That's a subtext we need in what we do these days with everything. In terms of our output per U, because I used to use one per hectare, but I can't really do that anymore because with conservation, with some of the ways we're going to need to farm, our per hectare one will change. But as an individual, that U can still be used as a matrix. And we can have things like, you know, what she's weaning effectively, but really what she's selling. And that's a combination of carcass weight and her prolificacy and survivability, survival. And we get lots of lambing information or scanning information in now. And we get lots of people confusing what is a scanning percentage or a rearing percentage to what is a proper lambs rear per you tucked. Because that's really the matrix we need to be looking at. And um, because we tend to forget about those barren ewes, we tend to forget about those wet dries at the end of lambing because we're fed up with lambing. We forget about the sheep that have wronged us and they've had a a stripe on their back and forgotten because when it comes to shearing that stripes come off again and she's joined the main flock again so lots of things like that that sort of distort that but crucially it's the lambs that live are the ones that make us the money so the other stuff is just sort of um, ego so within our selection indices we are putting the brakes on your weight so these are sort of the elements that we put into our index and we're holding the weights, that's an Aberfield one there, so that we can actually reduce or keep its maintenance down while the other bits are increasing. So it's a pretty important component. And interestingly, we found different ways of doing this. 
As some of you know, when you're looking for prolificacy, number of lambs reared, it's got a really low heritability. You're talking about something that's less than 10% heritable. But guess what we found? Our condition score breeding value has got really good heritability. So what that's telling us is that if you've got a ewe that can hold a condition and recover quickly, and she can get to that three and a half in her condition, she's gonna scan really well. So we've got a separate tool rather than just numbers scanned or, or numbers reared as a tool to measure how our sheep can be bred to be productive. A condition score one is a really important one because it's more heritable. And we know as soon as we get up to those three and a halves and condition scores, not only have we actually set the good prolificacy for scanning, but also she's at the best possible score to actually hold the condition when it's the expensive time of year to put condition on. So breeding sheep that actually have the ability to hold their flesh through the year is a really important part of what we do. And we ask our breeding partners to take repeat conditions going away to our sheep at four points in the year so that we can actually build that into it. But it's coming through pretty solid um, in terms of, of what that's doing for us really. In terms of some of the data capture we have to use with some of this, and this is in the nucleus itself. This was in Wales before it moved up, but the same will happen um, shortly in the borders. We use our pregnancy scanning data, the top left picture, to predict what that ewe is going to be giving us. And on the bottom right there, you'll see that they're taking DNA samples of these lambs coming in when they're four weeks old. They've not been tagged at birth. They've all been left to get on with it. Um, and then we will match back on the DNA. And if we're getting discrepancies between what's been scanned, what's there from a DNA match point of view across the whole flock, then those you start getting to penalized. Um, we've got Kim, our geneticist is also doing a PhD um, with SAC actually with Kathy um, on lamb mortality and, and behavior at lambing time, as well as doing her day job. Because that's what we do. Um, so you see there Kim doing post-mortems of, of any dead lamb in the nucleus to actually work out how they suckled, how they breathed, so that we can actually hone that in. But ironically, and even DNA dead lambs, which aggrieves me because it costs a 16 pence a sample, a 16 pound a sample to do, but we DNA sample dead lambs so we can actually build that data set on DNA parentage and the profile um, so we can actually train the data sets for genomic predictors. So ironically, the cost and effort in, in recording dead lambs gives us the ability to, to breed live ones. And we've got a much stronger heritability for lamb survival than what any other group globally is getting. So, and that's because we do all this rigmarole. It's always quite important, I think, um, to, sit, to look at genetic graphs and those red lines are showing the genetic trend in our Texel population, our Tex population, which is a maternal Texel, a combination of New Zealand and British Texels. And the red graph shows, the red line shows the genetic line going up, so in other words, going in the right way. But we always worry that, does that mean anything? The blue bars, the blue columns are actually the physics of what happens within the nucleus breeding programs, the, the breeding program for that Texel populations. And it's quite nice to check, isn't it, that whilst lamb vigor, we were actually assisting um, to suckle a reasonable number of sheep back in 2010 with this because there was less Kiwi influence in them probably and less selection. Um, we've now dropped that to a much lower respectable level and lambing assistance very much so. Um, in fact, across all our breed lines now, we're touching about 2% of the sheep in the system of, across all the different breed lines. So it's always good to double check that the breeding value or the genetic gain matches what we actually see on the ground. And we're happy to report that it does really. The other elements which we think are really important towards this sort of slightly different way of farming is our production costs um, and also the labor involved in some of these things. So the VetaMed with the disease resistance, fecal egg counting, and I'll talk about it shortly, and also the horrible jobs of crutching, shearing, foot treatment. We do have a shedding line we're developing. Some of you already have them with Easy Cares, Exlanas, doing a really good job. We also have a shedding line that we're starting to develop to go along with that. Um, within all of that. And we have to capture quite a lot of data to do that. So this is our guys doing foot scoring on the ewes. 
each individual food scored separately on, on a structure of health um, and, and taking in Shelley Wolf and other structures. Dark scoring use at one point in the year, again, so we can actually build that into a breeding value, fecal egg counting to get individual fact breeding values on the sheep. So quite a lot of work, but with a view of trying to reduce these kinds of things to our customers that buy the genetics. Longevity is a really important one because um, flock replacements, we think, and again, Daniel and his team might tell us better, they're about 10, 50% of the total cost on a sheep farm. And they're not very good for the environment any, either because the more replacements you need, effectively, the more immature sheep you have, the bigger the attrition between a shearling and a two-year-old. Um, and we've seen that from some of the work we've done at different stages in research. Um, and generally speaking, the more older ewes that are still productive in the flock, the better. So we've been uh, recording reasons for culling for many years now, and we have a productive life breeding value. So we can highlight rams that will produce daughters that are more likely to give you five plus lamb crops and still perform. And we're also trying to work that in with tooth structure, but we're in the process of disentangling where we've been measuring that. We think there's actually more issues possibly with the molar teeth in sheep than we've been thinking. So everybody look at the front and the mouth in sheep to see if its mouth is over or not. But we're coming to the conclusion that it's actually what's happening in the back of the jaw seems to have a bigger effect. Because when we do fall and stock postmortems, sheep that haven't been performing for no logical reason, and there's no iceberg disease in them, when we work with people like Ben Strugnell, Ben opens the jaw up and says, look at what's happening in those molars there. And actually there's tooth loss. So that's an area we're going to have to try and disentangle because I don't fancy sticking my fingers in the back of a sheep's mouth, but we need to find a way of trying to disentangle that somehow within all of this. In terms of our Abamax population, which is one of our terminals, growth rate, so easy lambing, growth rate without hard feed. And in that population, you can see we've actually, we use 42 kilos as a good target of a, a typical sort of slow to weight. Um, and in, as you can see in the last few years, within the pure population, we've actually, again, we've dropped um, over 20 odd days to get to that weight, which is huge because that's 20 days of eating um, feed. And that's actually 20 days earlier if you're trying to hit an early market. So again, getting growth, days to slaughter, crucially important um, with some of this in the system. We try and tell people to invest in the outcomes of the rams as opposed to individual sheep. Although people obviously, the heart takes over from the head sometimes, but I would say that the first thousand rams we sold in 2020 all went out to customers unseen. And that's a real testament of trust and people starting to understand that these sheep will deliver based on what they're predicted to do. So there is step changes in that where people are moving more towards this approach where outcomes make the difference for them. And really important is that rams, when people buy them, last and cover lots of use, so there's an impact. Our rams last year in the survey averaged 4.6 years, and there was a U to tupping ratio of about 70. So it was about 320 odd uh, use covered in a lifetime of ram. In this little box here, it's four years and 80, gets you to the same sort of number. But a really interesting component is the real cost of your ram is how many ewes are you putting it to and getting in lamb and how many years, seasons is it lasting? That's the real cost of the ram, not what you paid in the mart for him. And that's an important exercise, but there is on the Innovis website a little calculator that you can actually put your figures in and it'll actually calculate it for you. But it's not rocket science, it's just trying to work through those things. Just to finish off, we have New Zealand genetic lines that are 100% New Zealand. We bring rams in every couple of years, and that enables us to fast track. Um, fast track for certain traits. So in this one, you'll see lamb eating quality there, which enables us to actually move quicker. The next import of maternals that will be coming in, we'll be looking to get some of the methane reduction work that's already going on in New Zealand, fast tracking us over here within some of that. Um, it's really important, the New Zealand tag on an animal doesn't make it the silver bullet. 
and we know that because we've evaluated these and quite often we can breed things that are better than them from within the populations here but it is important to look at them so our focus genetic terminals in New Zealand that's the their genetic gain and where they sit compared to industry terminal sires in the cross breed evaluations in New Zealand but like I say there will be some animals that come over here that will bottom out with us and some that will perform but we have to just take that in, on board having a New Zealand tag does not make it a silver bullet necessarily it's got lots of good things in it but not necessarily and one of the things we do this is some of those rams we hold little um, detailed tests on them so this is uh, with Ben Anthony down in uh, the project we're running with Keepak because people keep up by some of these rams from us. So it shows you where we used eight rams in that flock last year, 354 lambs produced, 2% um, um, assisted at birth, 8% mortality from the whole flock, 19.4 um, kilos and hitting pretty good grades, 316 grams a day slaughter. And you can see grades for confirmation moving up. So I know a lot of you that might be on the call that are Texo Beltex breeders look at them and think, what a very awful looking prosperous thing. But actually, if you take that head away, it actually performs um, and it takes some catching up with. So quite interesting sometimes to see um, when that happens. And we have to keep on this and do these sorts of things so that we can absolutely make sure that it's working on the ground rather than us just putting it up on some charts here and there. And I think that's probably me done. Um, if you want to speak to anybody in your region about some of these things, I've put on the bottom there the contact details for some of our team up north. So. That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Debbie. I think we've got a, got a lot to think about. I think there's a lot of exciting new traits as well uh, on the breeding front coming out. Um, I think as well, looking at a lot of the kind of forage-based systems, they might kind of present the opportunity to, to produce, you know, lower, cheaper quality lamb, sorry, uh, cheaper at our lower cost, but uh, it really highlighted to me that presentation, the importance um, of having flexibility in the system uh, and monitoring what you're doing. And perhaps they take more management than actually a more heavier input based system where you rely on the concentrates and it's a reliance, isn't it? Um, we've got a few great questions here. Um, I suppose thinking about how you record on, on the nucleus flock with the DNA. This is maybe more targeted at your breeding partners, but we've got a question here asking, how do you go about recording lambing traits, in particular lambing ease, lamb vigor? What, what's the protocol there? Sure. When it comes to the the wider breeding partners, um, they will record in a slightly more standard way, where they will record if there's been assistance to the ewe. So there'll be a zero for no assistance, and there'll be a five if she's had to have a cesarean, which they don't anyway, but um, normally a three means that you've actually had to lamb it too. Um, you just happen to be there and you weren't quite sure. Four is normally, you know, head down, head rope, hassle. We, we've moved away from those fours and fives, really, especially the maternal use. Um, so there's a recording system based on that. There is also a recording system based on um, the lamb's vigor. And that's simpler in the fact that we don't score each particular lamb, but we score if it's had to have any level of intervention by 24 hours, and if it's had to have intervention for 48 hours. So there's an element of that. And there's also a score on the maternal element of the ewe if she's behaving as a ewe in terms of is she following if it's in a confined place, is she buggered off outside. So those traits feed in. From, an, from a nucleus point of view on the DNA, we will deal with ewes that are giving us problems there and then, and they will get tagged. Um, so they will get tagged um, at that point, and that information overlays over the DNA. But as I said, about 2% of the sheep that are actually getting any level of intervention. And that 2% is across the whole breeding program, not just the nucleus. So our even at terminal sire lines that have a maxes and blacks are really easy lambing because we've actually put lambing ears into the index before a few years ago it would be completely separate trait not not recorded but now it's within the the index itself so if something gives hassle at lambing time it actually gets dropped in index and if it comes under a certain point it tends to become um, a fat lamb somewhere as opposed to a breeding sheep 
So quite a lot of detailed records coming Brilliant. in to, to the system. Yeah, huge amount of opportunity there, isn't there? What have you found on the maternal site in terms of maternal behaviour? Is there a, a strong genetic component there? or? Yeah, there is different behaviour. Um, we're finding the New Zealand line, the Highlander, behaves differently. So um, what the, the limited amount we've done in terms of behaviour thus far outdoors is that the Highlander will actually go find shelter to lamb. And quite often we'll sit with her lambs for about a day and a half, two days without grazing. She's effectively using herself as cover for the lamb or her lambs because they're quite prolific. Whereas some of the other breeds will get up and go graze. So quite a different dynamic in all of that. That was just some work done with Bangor University with Charlotte Pritchard that was doing a, started a PhD with us. That work has stopped, but it'll be elements that probably Kim will pick up in her PhD. But quite distinctive differences in behavior between those. But there was an element of shelter having an impact on that. So we were looking at, Charlotte actually looked at what she was doing in the lambing paddock. They were going into certain parts of the, of the, of the fields to lamb. And sheep being sheep will always go to the top of the ruddy field where, where predators are less likely to get to them. But obviously top of the field is where the bad weather is. They won't go to the bottom and there's nice shelter. So quite often we've been looking at systems where if you've only got one hedge there, if you get two or three continuous bad weather days, you know, can you put an artificial shelter further down that will pull them in so they don't pile on each other? So, so there are all sorts of dynamics that we don't know properly yet, if I was being honest, but work in progress. Great. No, there certainly is. I can um, certainly vouch for the, the Highlander. I haven't seen them in action uh, on the Nucleus Farm. Um, one final question, uh, just cost the time. Uh, condition scoring, is it better to have ewes that can use and replenish body reserves when rearing lambs? They might be thin at, at thin at weaning, I suppose. Or is it better to have ewes that hold condition during lactation? How do you disentangle that as well in a, in a breeding sense? Or where should commercial farmers make that decision? Um, I would need to check with Janet, our geneticist. But generally speaking, um, the ewes that seem to perform the best with us are the sheep that don't lose huge amounts of condition through that lactation and recover quickly. The ewes that, that lose a lot of condition through that period normally take longer to regain up. So generally speaking, the ewes, are, the ewes that actually hold condition slightly better all the way through. So in other words, they're doing less of this and more of this seem to be the better performers with us thus far. Yeah, now I would imagine there's going to be breed differences there because you've got to remember that when you condition score, for example, a pure Texel is going to feel different to condition scoring a hill you because you've actually got a lot more muscle there to begin with. So I think it's also an element of, of breed differences in some of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, condition score isn't just fat, is it? It's also muscle tone over the line. And you'll notice that we're weighing use at the same time as condition scoring them. So we're tracking the two elements at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting stuff. We've actually got one final question. It's from Emily Grant. Is your Bangor University research giving any rule of thumb for increased maintenance requirements during bad weather? You mentioned 30% <laughs> is how much more you would allocate is that on an energy or dry matter basis? That was on a dry matter basis, um, that observation. I don't know the actual, um, I don't know the actual megajoule difference in what they're using. Um, it's an area I think we need to think about, and it's certainly an area we also need to think about from a, because we also have a shedding line we're developing, and we're not quite sure yet if there's going to be any impact, because obviously there are two elements to that. There is the insulation element, which wool, although it's a costly affair quite often, may not be quite the same. So we also need to look at that from a shedding breeds to see does it actually have any greater impact on them or not. You know, there's plenty of people with easy cares in hard environments in the borders and different places that I'm sure don't see any issues. But actually, I don't know the actual mega dual difference in that for Emily. Um, we just know that the, the intake changes. That's brilliant. I think that'll be, um, we better wrap this up in terms of questions. Thanks very much, Debbie. Thanks everyone for viewing. Thanks very much, Debbie, uh, for your time. It was uh, very, very interesting.
Thank you.